Hi, come get ready to go to jail with me tonight. I'm going to jail. I have two defendants in custody to interview, so I'm packing my bag. Um, I'm packing my briefcase here, and then I'm putting all my stuff together. So uh, for competency, I'm bringing the ESTR. These are questions that I need to ask defendants to determine if they, are, they understand their charges and can work with their attorney. So this is the evaluation of competency to stand trial, and I bring that. Um, I bring releases of information if I want them to sign records for medical records, but I get those from the jail beforehand. Um, I'm bringing inventory of legal knowledge. That's a quick screener if I have to use the basic understanding of courtroom stuff. And then I bring the Milan, a psychopathology assessment, and that is um, if I want to do a differential diagnosis to determine what their diagnosis might be. I don't always give that, but I like to have options. Um, tonight I'm seeing somebody who I think has intellectual disability or impairment, so I'm bringing the RIAS, the Reynolds Intellectual Assessment Screener, brief IQ test, quick like verbal, nonverbal problem-solving situation. Some basic questions. I can do a quick IQ screen or just get a range um, just so I'll know kind of where their their deficit is. So those are really handy to have. Um, I also bring the MOCA, um, a cognitive screener, especially for dementia. Um, sometimes I see some older folks and they don't... Um, they have poor short-term memory um, or there's some deficits in their thinking, so I can just ask them basic questions. So I make sure I have all those screeners and any of the tests that I give, I compile them and put them in my reports. So I put everything in my briefcase here. Um, I make sure I have my ID and I try not to wear any metal just so I won't set up, set off the medical metal detector. Um, you can't bring your phone. Um, I dress really casual. I'm going in the evening after 6 p.m. because it's after med pass, so everyone's quiet, everyone's had their meds, there's no other visitors right now, it's gonna be really calm and quiet. And I do that because sometimes there's loud screaming and wailing and door slamming and chaos and people that, it's just really overwhelming and they can't actually hear what I'm saying. So I like to go when it's really quiet because there's a glass partition between us and then since there's no people going in and out off shifts. I don't have to hear the door slamming. So it's actually more peaceful time. Uh, so that's it. Yeah, I have my files. I have everything. I fit it all in my backpack. And then um, I usually bring a closed bottle of water and I have that to drink because I'll be there a couple hours, probably at least an hour for each interview. It just depends on um, how communicative they are or how willing they are to participate. I bring my laptop here and I just, I type on the computer like this while they're giving me the information. And so I don't really need to take any notes. I just type fast and then I can edit it later. Um, I do a lot of competency evaluations, at least a couple competency evaluations each week for the state of Ohio. And they set up everything for me remotely. They get all my medical records. They get the defendants who are out on bail to show up for their virtual appointment. Or they set me up in the psych hospital or the jail. They set up the remote link. And then I just, they show up in my virtual waiting room. And I assess them from home in my office here. And I write their report. And um, so yeah, you can do like 10 of those a month if you want. And they're pretty straightforward. Um... Ohio standards are a little bit different. They want they do competency and insanity together. Um, insanity is, you know, at the time of the crime, did they have a rational, you know, did, could they understand right from wrong? Competency is their current mental state. Can they work with their attorney right now and go to court? Um, so they're two different questions. Sometimes I've been seeing some guys that... Um, they're totally competent and based on all the body cam footage and evidence, they, they weren't insane at the time of the crime. And sometimes they're referred for reasons um, that, 
you know, sometimes different people can refer them for these evaluations. Um, it's not always their defense attorney. Sometimes it actually could be the prosecution to delay proceedings. There's many reasons. Uh, but anyway, I do my job and um, yeah, I get a lot of really interesting cases. Tonight, we got an arson case and a sex offender case. So, um, but for a, the role of a forensic psychologist is not, it's not whether, I'm not assessing guilt or innocence, I'm doing a specific legal question. One of the cases I'm doing sentencing recommendation for an alleged sex offender. And the other one I'm doing competency evaluation. Um, so each case is a little bit different, but if you're interested in becoming a forensic psychologist, these cases are backed up for months and months and months and there's not enough forensic psychologists and not enough people that are licensed as a psychologist and so I that's why I'm posting this information I'm hoping that more people will get interested so if you want to be a forensic psychologist you have to be licensed as a psychologist under the board of psychology and if you're not sure how to do that just go to the board of psychology website in your state look at the requirements and follow those that's it. You have to have a doctorate degree, which takes 10 years, and then you have postdoc training and licensure. So you have to be licensed under the Board of Psychology and have forensic training experience. And yeah, so let me know if you have